Good noon tide from sunny Honolulu. This is Howard Wig, Think Tech Hawaii, Code Green. We have met climate change head on, or it has met us head on with a horrible punch to the island of Maui. And I think Jeff Michalina and I are both thankful that the phrase climate change keeps recurring over and over and over as this event is covered worldwide. And we, we more, mourn our, our friends and neighbors on, Mo, on uh, Maui. So guest today, the honorable famous Jeff Michalina. Many of you know him from Sierra Club and many, many other environmental affiliations. He is now executive director of the Climate Coalition of the Hawaii Executive Collaborative. Welcome again, Jeff. It's been a long time since we've seen one another. So yeah. begin by telling us, what is the Hawaii Executive Collaborative? Thanks, Howard, and th thanks for having me on. Um, I just want to give a quick shout out to you. You are one of those unsung heroes. You've been working at the Energy Office for I don't know how many how many decades now? <laughs> a lot of just important work that people don't often see, uh, see and that's with doing a uh, building code and efficiency work and it's so critical. So thank you for all your service. Mm -hmm. yep. um, so you asked about the Hawaii Executive Collaborative's Climate Coalition. This is a fairly new uh, organization. The Executive Collaborative has been around for decades, um, but what we're doing with the Climate Coalition and we've been at it for about a year is trying to have a new conversation around climate, um, particularly for Hawaii's business leaders and organizations. Um, in my experience, it, there's been an, maybe an unfortunate pattern of, um, you know, advocates wanting to push something at the legislature or otherwise, and sometimes we hit friction with um, some folks who um, it, it, are, are, aren't coming along necessarily with some of the changes necessary. So what we're hoping to do is to change that conversation and uh, engage the business community and other organizations in what does it look like to operate in this new climate era that we're in? Um, how do you be good you know, corporate and organizational citizens in Hawaii, uh, given what we know now about climate? Um, and so we're tackling this, this uh, challenge in two ways. One, working with organizations to reduce their carbon footprint and set goals, um, so very tangible you know, uh, near-term and long-term goals to eliminate their carbon footprint. And then importantly, the second part is working collectively on our systemic challenge of just changing how we do uh, business in Hawaii um, that's working at the policy side, trying to bring as much federal funds into Hawaii, um, but really just create a different conversation around uh, climate change and, and how, we, um, how we are in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And do you do that primarily through a series of meetings, Zoom meetings, in-person meetings, or what, what is your yeah. mechanism there? It's been a bit of both. So for example, during the last legislative session, we um, had bi-weekly meetings. We get about 25 to 30 organizations participate. Um, mm -hmm. We quickly go over kind of priority climate and energy legislation, but we decided to kind of converge on a couple of, of bills, uh, one of them, was an appropriation for Hawaii's Green Bank, or what's known as the GEMS program, um, to provide low in interest loans for largely low income families. Uh, and that was a success. And so we're happy to see that, that pass and a, a 50 million uh, went to the Green Bank, which will hopefully leverage some federal funds to do even more good uh, to get solar on, on folks' rooftops who otherwise couldn't participate in clean energy. So we see that as, you know, sort of the sweet spot. Can we identify policies that uh, we can actually influence um, and that are high impact? Um, what was particularly exciting to me is when we, you know, worked on this and submitted testimony, we had um, support from groups like uh, some familiar names, uh, Zippies, uh, Young Brothers, Alexander and Baldwin, mm -hmm. uh, companies you might associate with, you know, clean energy or climate, uh, but they express support for, this legislation, and we really hope to, you know, channel that and get more of the support in because this, again, this is how we need to behave uh, in 2023, knowing what we know about climate. Mm -hmm. And economic benefits, quite a, 
aside from the climate, is number one, the more clean energy we have, the more dollars stay in Hawaii, and we are promoting good paying jobs. Basically exactly. Like yeah. Yeah. Uh, and critically helping folks, again, who, you know, otherwise wouldn't be participating, and, and this, that's such a, I think, such an important Hawaii value that we all go together on our journey to 100% uh, mm -hmm. clean. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, those are some of the things that that we're looking at, and then I think going into the next session, uh, particularly with uh, the horrific um, uh, just disaster in Maui, looking at resilience and adaptation, and how can we support um, uh, policies and programs to really increase our resilience in Hawaii, uh, so we can we know what's coming. I mean, we need to do our our part on reducing emissions, uh, and then let's strengthen Hawaii so we can. Um, you know, work through these these changes that are coming. Yeah, part of uh, the job I do is serve as chair of the State Building Code Council, which governs all the building codes. And we are certainly looking at strengthening both homes and businesses in new construction and in renovation. For one thing, now making them not totally fireproof, but much more fire resistant. I understand that on the coast of Lahaina, there's a home there that's virtually intact. What was going on with that one? We, we don't know yet. But that's what we need to move for, toward. And doing this in a cost-effective way also. You don't have to add twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 to a cost of a home in order to make it resilient. Yeah. And then uh, along the same lines is looking at the economics. Because something that I know you've struggled with, we've struggled with, is uh, sometimes these things cost a little bit more up front, but they save so much month after month in utility bills, maybe in reduced insurance needs, and of course, mm -hmm. in time of disaster. So how do we account for that value um, up front? And so it doesn't just look like a loser to, you know, a new homeowner or renter. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's, that's where, you know, policy plays a role, but also all the funding available from the, the federal government now to help maybe buy down some of those higher cost items. Absolutely. And I'm glad you use the word insurance because you may be aware that State Farm has pulled out of Florida and pulled out of California. And yeah. all of us, even if we're not in flood prone, flood, flood prone or fire prone areas, we're going to get hit with insurance increases. Good friend of mine is an insurance executive, and he, he just shakes his head when he, he thinks about this. It's scary, yeah. But on the other hand, when we come up for legislature or before the city council, we can bring the insurance people with us now. Not another coalition. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a great idea because again, yeah, we're all in this together, and uh, we just have to behave differently now that we know what we know. Yeah, I, I was kind of lamenting the beautiful winter we had and the beautiful weather we've had before that. And then we had a very nice spring and the summer is actually mild, very mild. We've just barely, barely touched beyond 90 degrees. And then we compare that to a place like Texas, my goodness. Yeah. So I was saying, we haven't been hit in the face with climate change, but wow, the folks yeah. on Maui, they sure think differently now. So much suffering going on there. So hard to see, because I think you're right. We would, you know, we saw the smoke that was happening on the East Coast, and we saw the, the storms and the floods. And, you know, I, I think a lot of us felt like, well, that, that's unfortunate. That's over there. Good thing we're in Hawaii. But you're right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, a terrible wake-up call. And the economic impact on this island, we haven't even really thought hard about that yet. It's going to be tremendous. Yeah. Yeah. So sad. So you mentioned that there were two pieces of legislation that uh, you got through past session. Do you remember what the the second one was? Uh, Unfortunately, only one uh, advanced, and that was the oh, appropriate okay. bank. The other one uh, was in regards to permitting for solar. Um, so it's been a frustration to many. Uh, obviously, permitting is always a always a challenge, but 
particularly for something like putting, you know, solar on top of a rooftop, um, we do have a, a pretty uh, rigorous process, and there are tools now to streamline that process. And that's what this particular measure was going to do: is um, employ those tools that would make it easier for both, you know, the um, inspector side and uh, the permitting side, and also for for homeowners and businesses. Um, also, raising the threshold to trigger that uh, permitting. Uh, because again, we have over 100,000 rooftops that have solar. We know how to do this. These are licensed contractors doing this work um, and we need to do a whole lot more of it. So let's let's break down any barriers that prevent folks from doing that. Attacking it on the financing side with things like the Green Bank, um, leveraging as much federal funding to, to help with this, and then just the, the nuts and bolts permitting. Let's make that as easy as possible so um, we can just you know, adds renewables at the speed and scale that we need to in Hawaii. And we need we need that speed and scale. And I know that DPP is working really, really hard on, on this issue. And we secured a uh, federal grant, which we we used to hire a consultant to work directly with DPP on, on these issues. Great. Yeah. Great to hear. And I, I hear from industry that in many, many cases, solar applications are going through just, just like that. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And then the next step after that is called grid interactive. I don't know if you've uh, thought about that at all. Because we're, you know, the power plant used to be those central things out on the, the Waianae coast. And now the power plant is a form of 100,000 different units and the solar farms and the wind farms. And we have to connect all of those. And that is going to be a great growth industry involving some really, really bright people. This is electrical engineering on, on steroids. Yeah. yeah. It's such an exciting future. And, you know, talking about resilience, um, as you as we have 100,000, you know, power plants on top of rooftops statewide, can really strengthen our, our um, ability to withstand disasters and bounce back better. Um, but you're right, what a, what a cool opportunity with, you know, now that so many folks have batteries, we have distributed solar, and now with electric vehicles too. I mean, they should be playing a large role in helping to store, smooth out the fluctuations on the power grid. Um, and I, I, I don't think folks necessarily realize just how big of a change this is, uh, you know, moving from that centralized model to a, a distributed model. But to think about vehicles that are currently on Hawaii's roads that can power your home for days, if not weeks, um, it's just game. Yeah. And Hawaiian Electric is moving toward entering into agreement with the EV owners saying, can we temporarily or just for 15 minutes or 30 minutes use your battery as a mini power plant when we're when we need some extra juice? Yeah. And if the EV owner signs off on that, it's voluntary, boom, he gets a, a discounted rate for his electricity. I, that's great. And that's exactly how we should be looking. I think some folks think, oh, electric vehicles, they're going to, you know, increase load. They're going to require mm -hmm. use. Um, and, and that's obviously true, but it's a different kind of electricity use. And it's one that can be managed and ultimately be an asset. Uh, so that's how we should view this. We have a bunch of assets on wheels. Um, mm -hmm. You know, gas cars were kind of a one-way sort of thing. You put gas in them and you made carbon dioxide. But now we have a vehicle that essentially gets cleaner by the day too, as our you know energy grid adds more renewable energy to it. So just just an, such an exciting future, and it, it's good to see that you know we're we're making decent progress on electric vehicles, but it's still just shy of 3% of overall vehicles. So we have a long, long way to go. Long way to go. And uh, hastening that change is the fact that Hawaiian Electric is moving towards uh, time of day pricing, where we get on a nice sunny day like today, we have much, much, much too much uh, renewable energy being produced. So now we are storing the heck out of it at the home level, at the ranch level, and using it only when we need it. We have something called the evening peak where everybody comes home from school and uh, all the tourists come in from the beaches and so forth and turn on everything in the hotels. And we have this great 
big surge of need for electricity, boom, all that stored up electricity in the middle of the day can, can feed that. Yeah, so th this is gonna be a great experiment that Hawaiian Electric is rolling out with these differentiated rates depending on, on the time of day. Um, mm -hmm. And to your point, it, it sort of breaks the myth that every electron is you know, valued equally when it's not. I mean, it depends mm -hmm. where it's produced, where it's produced, how it's produced. Uh, and, and my personal feeling is we should value it um, not as that bulk commodity, but as a special, you know, each electron is valued differently and should be priced uh, appropriately. It, it's, it's difficult though. This is one of those difficult changes. Um, you know, some, some things are fairly easy as we make this transition. This is one that's gonna be uh, challenging to navigate because there's some folks who are gonna have a hard time making shifts to their, to their energy use. Mm -hmm. So any we can provide them to make sure it's, um, it's seamless and then tools to help them move their, move their load to the, the lowest cost time. Um, but that is important to help, help people. Um, yeah, well, just recognize the value and recognize the times when our electricity is lowest carbon. Yeah, it's gonna take a great big educational effort too. Uh, just for instance, with this uh, time of day pricing, uh, people can set their dishwasher, their clothes washer, and their dryers all to come on in the middle of the day, not simultaneously, but one, two, three, say spaced an hour apart, and suck up that cheap electrical energy right there. And I've seen one figure, certainly don't want to be quoted on it, at 19 cents a kilowatt hour in the middle of the day, boom, you shift to that evening peak. Let's try 69 cents a kilowatt hour. Now that that needs to be accompanied by a huge educational effort, but uh, there's something called timers. You time all these devices to go on in the middle of the day, and therefore you don't contribute to the the evening peak. Uh, yeah, ultimately is going to make our electricity a lot cheaper too. Yeah, uh, and you're you're right. It's going to take a lot of education, and then making sure folks have those tools too, uh, so mm -hmm. they can so not. <laughs> not suffer from the super high rates. And then, mm -hmm. you know, that is going to be technology. I mean, we, we've seen so many, uh, uh, so much storage added to the grid, both in terms of residential business batteries, as well as large scale batteries. Uh, and then we might see some other, you know, storage technologies come to market that will help uh, really just even out when we have renewable energy, when we need to, you know, store it for times when we don't have the sun and the wind. Um, so yeah, a lot of lot of exciting changes ahead. Mm -hmm. Have you talked with the coalition about the power of energy efficiency? Yeah, so that's coming up in in terms of as these organizations take their initial sort of carbon inventory and they look at opportunities to reduce their carbon footprint. Efficiency is always you know top of the list. So uh, we have a partnership with Hawaii Energy. Um, and then with the organization called DEIC, which Brian Kealoha um, is working with now, mm -hmm. uh, energy efficiency, you know, third party. So helping, you know, organizations look at all the opportunities that they can reduce um, uh, their energy use or shift it. And then looking at opportunities on top of that to add renewable energy like solar, and then even going into their fleets and how they can reduce their transportation footprint. So um, I think that the important Part of this process is, you know, you can only manage what you measure. So having the organizations do that carbon footprint, actually quantify it, um, and then set targets. Uh, and these will be public. So there's a little bit of, you know, peer pressure going on and uh, hopefully, you know, establishing some social norms about what are the appropriate targets for local organizations. Um, and maybe a little competition too, you know, so mm -hmm. we have banks looking at their competitors and how are they doing and in terms of their carbon footprint, uh, folks in the visitor industry as well. Um, but we think, you know, Hawaii is the perfect place for this sort of initiative because it's it's small enough where, where we, we have those relationships and, and that trust among each other um, and can kind of establish new norms about how we behave uh, with, with our, within our climate era here. I'll just give a, the, Best example of energy efficiency 
some of us are old enough to remember the incandescent lamp. That's <laughs> that pear-shaped thing that got hotter than blazes. I once measured a 100 watt incandescent at 365 degrees Fahrenheit, literally hot enough to set a fire. And then we shifted to the screw-in LEDs, uh, not LEDs, the CFLs, compact fluorescent lamps. And now we're at the LED source. The incandescent's got 15 lumens per watt. The CFLs about 45 lumens per watt. Now, this is something I track, we're up at average 90 lumens per watt, or equivalent to miles per gallon for your typical LED that you buy off, off the shelf. And that produces virtually no heat. I mean, you can put your hand on it and there's some heat at the base, but that, that's it. I, I know you used to do a great demonstration. You either, you put a sock on the, or, or something and it would, mm -hmm. you just keep talking, but then you saw it start smoking. <laughs> yeah, and people would panic, yeah. Yeah, yeah the, those, those were kind of space heaters first and lights <laughs> second. Precisely, uh, yeah. But hey, we just passed the, I think it was a few weeks back, the, the final um, incandescent phase out, right? Mm -hmm, and so the last mm -hmm. yeah. shelves and um, yeah, again, a great example of sort of technology moving so quickly and mm -hmm. they are, I mean, almost indistinguishable from, you know, the, the, the light that people kind of grew up with. Um, so, yeah. but, you know, we have every other, as you know, from air conditioning, that has to be a revolution and how we produce to uh, transportation and, and each part of our, our energy system um, from top to bottom really has to, has to be reformed. Yeah, Hon Honolulu just passed, as you mentioned, uh, Bill 4, its new energy efficiency building code. And we got into that, the definition of efficient lights, which are required, 70 lumens per watt. A CFL cannot reach 70 lumens per watt. So we have effectively phased out uh, CFLs from, from Honolulu. And refrigerators, with all the bells and whistles that new refrigerators have, tremendously more efficient than, than older refrigerators. Yeah. So you're, you're getting comfort, value, higher lifestyle at a vastly reduced uh, energy use. Yeah, yeah. What about and, uh, tra transportation? Now, are you guys looking at transportation efficacy at all? Or? We will be, and, and we have to be, because that is our single biggest, you know, uh, contributor to uh, climate change in Hawaii. Um, and it's it's the trickiest one. It, you know, I was giving a, a presentation a couple of weeks ago, and, and someone asked, you know, it seems like photovoltaic PV adoption has gone fairly quickly, but EV adoption isn't quite as quick. Uh, and I think there's a, there's I mean, a number of reasons for that. Uh, one of them being the, the, some of the barriers such as charging infrastructure that exist for electric vehicles. But there's also a different relationship. You know, if, if you have a home and you put photovoltaic on your roof, everything kind of stays the same. Like electricity is electricity. Your refrigerator works the same. You know, it's, it's it's not a big change, except your bill goes down. With an electric vehicle, I mean, there's there's a lot of um, there's attachment to vehicles. You know, people name their vehicles. It's it's a sort of self, you know, identity. Um, so it's it's a it's a different sort of you know uh, conversation about switching to to electric, and and sometimes a lifestyle change as well. So um, we have so much work to do on that front because we are. Honestly, we're among the worst in the world when it comes to our carbon footprint. And we like to think that, you know, Hawaii is so beautiful and we're making progress and we are, but we still are among the worst. Probably, you know, uh, last calculation was 94% um, is where we are per capita for greenhouse gas emissions uh, compared to the rest of the world per capita. So um, and a lot of that's due to our location and we have to fly here. So exciting to see some of the progress on sustainable aviation fuels and some local companies that are looking at either using waste or actual carbon capture to make jet fuel that's sustainable. And then some commitments from local companies, Hawaiian, uh, Alaska, and others to use um, you know, less carbon intensive fuels. Yeah, and we're getting uh, 
biofuel powered buses and we just launched uh, the hy hydrogen buses. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. And then the electrics it means great to see the electric buses, um, yeah. both tourism and city buses on our streets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And somebody proposed to me in our final couple of minutes that all we have to do is raise the price of gasoline and by two dollars a gallon and commensurately upscale the other fossil fuels and turn a lot of that money into free bus rides for everybody and subsidizing electric vehicles uh, up one side and down the other. That's all we need to do. Simple. <laughs> I'm with you. 100%. And, you know, we, yeah, for years, we, we pushed a, uh, a policy at the legislature that was called the fee bait, which essentially would have a, you know, higher fee on gasoline powered luxury vehicles and then use the, 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 re, the funds collected to subsidize you know, um, more affordable electric vehicles. Um, it used to be called Hummers pay for hybrids, but now it's, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Porsches pay for, you, you pick electric vehicle, mm -hmm. but something like that too. I mean, we do need these incentives because thinking about vehicles that are purchased today and the number one selling vehicle in Hawaii is the Toyota Tacoma, they're gonna be on our streets for 10, 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, and that we just can't do that. I mean, we, we can't do that with um, what we know now about climate. Mm -hmm. Yep, Oops. slightly daunting uh, task. We've got about one minute, Jeff. Do you want to uh, send some parting words our way? Oh, oh, you it, have a program, don't you? Sure. Uh, yeah. Program? Yeah. What what is that all about? Quickly, uh, it's on K two N two. It's called Empowered Hawaii. Um, and we share some of these positive stories of our progress toward a more sustainable future. It airs uh, 9.30 on the uh, fourth Tuesday of the month. Um, uh, KHON2, it's also online. But if we do have a second, I'll just share that, um, you know, we, it's, it's daunting what we face, but the good news is if we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, the atmosphere will recover, our temperatures will come down, the oceans will recover. This isn't... Um, this isn't a lost cause. We can still do this and Hawaii certainly lead. Yep, Hawaii in the lead and Mother Nature is very, very resilient. So that brings us to a close, Jeff Mikalina. So good to see you again and all the best in your new ventures. And this is Think Tech Hawaii Code Green, Howard Wig. See you next time. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn.